We're normally here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, the main questions we're looking to answer are what are the best games we played this past year, and what was the biggest gaming surprise of 2021? So as everyone knows, 2021 was um, an unusual year, as, just as the year before. Um, most of the year had everyone staying at home and quarantining and not getting out and playing games and just playing with uh, your, your immediate family or your bubble, as that is uh, the term that everyone has come to know now for your private group that you only interact with. Now, by the end of the year, though, things did start opening up. And what I was surprised to see is that a bunch of the big game conventions actually happened. So like PAX U, Gen Con, Origins. Was there an Origins? There was an Origins, was there not? Uh, yeah, I think sure. there was. Yeah. It was just late. I think it was in October. So you had all the big game con conventions did end up happening. And in addition, at least here locally, the local game shops opened up. And some of them, not all of them, started having regular open game nights again. Now that said, we didn't attend any of this. No cons, no public play, no game nights. I did go to the local game store, one of them, my favorite local game store, and check the place out because they moved um, for free RPG day. But I did a little bit of shopping, but I have not actually sat down and gamed with anyone, not at my house or at um, my mother-in-law's house. Due to the fact we've got some high-risk members in our family, just didn't feel that it was responsible for us to do so. And well, it turns out the pandemic isn't actually over, and maybe those cons shouldn't have happened anyways, but hindsight is, of course, 2020, and there were a lot of great games out there, despite some of the bad news in the world over 2021. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to get into it. if you should or shouldn't have. We didn't, is all that matters at this point. Now, due to this, it was a really odd year gaming-wise for us, especially for discovering new games. Now, yes, here on the show, we do try to keep up with the news and we do try to catch some of the new hotness. And we've even been using our Sunday brunch episodes to look at some of the great games that were released at Essen this year. And yes, I did pick up some games throughout the year, but I didn't get to try nearly as much new stuff as I would in a normal year, even less so than the year before, because at least the last year, up until March, we were out gaming and a lot of games come out at the beginning of the year and I at least got to see and try some of the games. Because the main way I often discover new games is at cons, right? Going and doing demos and paid events and actually playing through games and through local game nights. And while we didn't have either. So due to this, this more so than most of our top lists are not going to be comprehensive. We did not play very many of, of the new hotness or games that were released this year. So the list we're going to get to later on are games we played. And we didn't, like the best games we played this past year. But no, we did not play all the new games or most of the new games. Or honestly, we played a handful of the games that actually were released this year in 2020. So we are not going to be talking about the best games published in 2021. Though I did make a little short list of the ones I did try. But rather, these are going to be the games we had the most fun playing. Whether they're new to us or old favorites that we're still getting to the table. And indeed, we are just a couple of old cis white guys, and while we do our best to support all the communities, we don't pre present, pretend to represent anything other than what us and what is fun for us. Yes. Now, before we get to the top tens, I thought it'd be fun to share a few stats based on this past year. We usually do this every year, just to kind of take a look at it, and I mainly do it for my own sake, because I want to know. So in 2021, based on logging my plays on BoardGameGeek, which I try to log everything, both online plays and physical, I played 89 different games. Now that does count role-playing games as well as board games. I was smart enough to check both lists and merge the two. Um, and that's not counting any expansions. So there are quite a few actual expansions we tried this year for the first time. And I got to say like that sounds like 89 different games sounds like a lot, but that is a low number for me anymore. Uh, usually I'm in the hundreds at least, at least different games I've played. Now, what I did do a lot more of is that was over 400 plus different game plays. And of course, a huge part of that is playing online, playing board game arena, because this year, more so than any previous year, I spent way more time playing games online than I have previously for obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's been a, it's been a weird one, that's for sure. <laughs> now, I thought this is always interesting to look at as my most played games of the year. 
Uh, one thing that's funny is Race for the Galaxy is not on there at all because, like, I, I think we overplayed it last year on on Board Game Arena. We played so many games of Race for the Galaxy. I topped 100 game plays overall of that game. That one has dropped off the list It'd be just because, and you know what? If Eric started a new game, I'd probably start playing again. But at some point, someone didn't hit rematch and we just stopped playing. Now, what my most played game was Patchwork, which is mostly both Sean's playing with, um, with Sean from Hamilton and Sean Hamilton. Uh, we, I played, we Patchwork came out on Board Game Arena. And when you sit down and play that, it can play ridiculously quick. I honestly think you could probably real time finish a game in like five minutes if not 10. So Patchwork is my number one. Number two is Space Base, which actually surprised me. Like I, I knew it was up there. We played a lot of Space Base, but I didn't think that much. So my second most played game of 2021 is Space Base. My third is Adventuria. And the impress, like I know I've been playing a lot of Adventuria, but what's impressive about that is how long each game is. Like, like Adventuria, sitting down to play Adventuria is an event. Like you got to sort your decks and find your boxes and play your thing. I was surprised it was up there. It's it's in the 20s, so I played lots of Adventuria. Uh, next is Draconius Invasion, which the only reason it's that high is because we had to review the expansion and played 12 games in a row over two days. Um, so that is the main reason. And I'm not trying to bash on the game by saying that. It's just that's why it's up there so high, is we played through a 12-part campaign of that game in addition to just playing the game enough to review it in the first place. So you're looking at 20 plays of Draconis, uh, mainly so we can play through a whole campaign. And then the last um, is Codenames Duet, which I, I, that's just such a fantastic game. That, that's a go-to date night game for DNI. Uh, we play it with Corey and Kat. We prove to uh, Sean that it's not just a two-player game. In addition, during our extra live stream, we actually played a ton of Codenames with our chat room and other people joining us at Codenames.com, I think it is. I can't remember the name of the site, yeah. whatever it is, Codenames.com where it's free to play. So those were my top five games played. And yes, you will note that none of those came out in 2021. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been interesting. Physically, I played 23 games. Now, I, I record games differently than Mo. I don't record digital plays, uh, usually not even tabletop simulator plays. Um, but so 23 new games, which really isn't all that low a number for me, all things no. considered. Uh, thankfully I was able to get down to Windsor a couple of times during, uh, some safer periods and that, uh, allowed that there's probably about a dozen new games on board game arena, um, as well as some old favorites on board game arena that have, uh, debuted they, this year. Um, today they actually debuted a new game, a uh, spot it, which is an interesting one. This is their first sort of real time speed game specifically, yeah, specifically designed so that if you are playing on a touch screen, you have an advantage. Interesting. Yeah, Spotted, so that's a classic game that's been around for a lot of time that my kids enjoyed. Yep. Um, honestly, all we own is the um, Tabletop Day. It gave out a free pack, and it was like a mini pack. Right. But it gives you all you need to know about Spotted. My kids liked it, but didn't love it. I always thought it would be a good adult game, but I have other games. Like, I, I could play that or go cuckoo, so I tend yeah. to grab go cuckoo. But it is a fun game, and I, like except for you're saying there's a new way to play. I'm like, how the heck do you play that on Board Game Arena? Yeah, so they they I don't know how they've worked out the time. Like, I'm concerned about the timing of actual yeah. loading. Well, but, yeah, uh, like lag, right? If one player is lagging, that game just doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but there's a couple of different play modes. I haven't gone into it, but uh, that is there for fans of that game. I wonder if that'll lead to other games like like say Set or Ratuki, other other real time games. Well, I mean, it could be they you know it, it, Asmodee's got their hands in there and they are pushing yes. out a lot of games that's true it's almost one a day Actually, it is one a day right now isn't it Still? no they're st uh, are they doing one a day? i don't think they're doing one they a day were on. for a while but but they're they're definitely doing one they always do one a week so one a week is right. is every wednesday is, is usually new new game night or day yeah i gotta say 23 new games for you is is actually a pretty high number mm -hmm. i to be honest i'd have to go back through previous years to figure out what my real numbers are but it felt low right which reminds I, I, me, actually, speaking of which, sorry, Gaia Project. We need you, you need to teach me so we can play it on BGA. I don't own it. How do I teach you to play? A you game don't. I you don't own Gaia. I thought no, you did. I don't own Gaia Project. Well, we'll have to learn that then. Yeah, <laughs> we could learn it. I played it once, but it was someone else's copy who taught me, which I haven't read the rules myself, so I don't know how well that teach was. Right. All right. So. Let's get to the list. All right, so we're going to start with the top 10 list. So these are going to be the top 10 games we played in 2021. 
Um, I did rank them. So these are ranked, unlike our usual list, which aren't in any particular order. We're going to start at 10 and work our way up to one, and we'll take turns. We each do our 10, then our nine, then our eight. Uh, we're not going to do the dice tower thing. This is further up on the other person's list, which there is some overlap, but not a lot. There was more, but then as I refined my list, I, I took some off that we matched because I was like, well, Sean's going to mention that one, and I can at least say I liked it. So I did tweak mine once I saw Sean's list. Now, one of the things I do want to point out, again, just in case you're here to hear about the new hotness from 2021, I stuck to games that were new to me this year. So everything on this list, I had not played until 2021. You know. That said, <laughs> not in. all of them are games that came out in 2021. These are games I discovered in the last 12 months. Some are rather old. <laughs> now, did you do the same? Did you I, stick? I did. These are all new to no. me this year. Perfect. Okay. So when we first sat down to make the list, I'm like, I don't know, you can talk about your favorite game even with something old. And I do have one I want to talk about, but I'm going to save that for an honorable mention. So my number 10, and here's where we need to, you know, get someone to record number 10, because that's, that's the <laughs> Dice Tower thing. I don't want to steal the Dice Tower thing, but we need we need our countdown. And if it was a, if it, we weren't so busy, I would have Sean create something that we can flash <laughs> up for top list. I don't know what it'd be. Like a bell that dings 10 times. No, that'd drive everyone nuts. Yes, it would. Yes, <laughs> no. Now I'm tempted just to, to have a skip button. All right. So number 10 is Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. This is the most different Valeria game that's out there. The, the one that is the farthest from Hard Kingdoms of Valeria. This is a game where you are playing the bad guys who are attacking Valeria. And it is a dice-based worker placement game. But you're not placing the dice. You're placing a worker to collect dice of different colors that you're then going to use and the dice represent your warriors to do various attacks, various, various conquests. So you're going to sit there and go out and attack different areas of the Valeria landscape using your dice. I possibly shouldn't have put this on the list because I took something else off for the same reason. So I technically played this originally in 2020 because as a prototype, but it wasn't published until this year. And I haven't played now the published copy um, one thing I will give Daily Magic Games thumbs up for is the prototype in this are awesome. Like they're identical. There was no, wow, they need to fix this, need to change this. They sent me a complete game that just wasn't production ready. And now that I had the production copy, it looks amazing. It's the exact same game with better components. So strongly recommend Battle Kingdoms of Valeria. The one thing I haven't done yet is explored the expansion. That's on my, my two playlist. Check out the expansion. My number 10 for 2021, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. All right. Well, my number 10 is Marvel Strike Teams. Now, this was one that we got uh, on a deal that, uh, you know, I'd never even heard of it. Uh, but it was a it's a use of hero clicks without being hero clicks. So it's it's yep. using the click style, but for a different purpose. In this case, it's actually the stats as you level up. Uh, it is a uh, PvP uh playing where you it's, it's a team of heroes played by one or more players against a uh the the gm or villain of the thing with various setups and it was interesting it was fun uh my son and i had fun but not enough fun to actually get it back to the table again yet mm -hmm. um so it was it was interesting it was it was fun i think it's well done uh but it just didn't capture the imagination as well as we might have hoped it would so that's why marble strike teams while interesting is still only my number 10. So you said there's a DM. Is it an AI you're playing against? No, it's, it's or is the one player. player plays one, so it's a player. One player plays bad guys. One, okay. one or more player plays good guys. All right. So one versus many Marvel Strike teams. And what I just, I am so confused that they didn't make them hero click. Like, like that's bad. The Star Trek one I get, right? Like Star Trek so far apart, but these are superheroes and yep. hero clicks is superheroes. It seems really strange to have published this game without it being compatible with the rest of the hero click so unlike the the teenage mutant ninja turtles starter set that came out which had a fantastic cooperative game included in the box you can then use those with all the rest of your hero clicks. it's one i'm curious about um if we got together more often i'd say you should bring it down and play it but we've got lots of other stuff we could probably try for absolutely <laughs> next we have number nine for me that is the oldest game on this list, I think. I actually didn't compare it to another game this further down to see, but I think it's the oldest game on this list, and that is Yardmaster. I have to thank Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, for selling me his copy of this game way back 
when he was moving and didn't want to move all his games and needed some extra money. Thankfully, it's now still in our game group, so Sean can keep playing it. Every time I post online that I've been playing it, he's like, oh, I missed that game, and he's glad I got my copy. This is a not drafting game like Express. It is a train building game where you are adding cars to a growing train by matching the color or the number on the cards with the ability to trade in resources. So resource management, hand management, set collection, race to build freight trains. And that is Yardmaster. My number nine for 2021. All right, well, my number nine is a card game as well, although a very different card game. Uh, I went with Funfair, uh, which I think we all had a lot of fun playing. Uh, it was really good. It just wasn't the part game I wanted. Uh, it was too fun. And, and I guess, you know, again, we've, we've been <laughs> talking fun. in the Discord about uh, we're playing Park Attack now and we're having great memories, Roller Coaster Tycoon and the other games from that genre in the past. And one of the things that happens in those games is, you know, bad things happen. There, there is some nastiness. Even if you're not actively playing against other players, some things happen. And that's just sort of part of life you, as you expected from a theme park. Mm-hmm. And, and for that matter, it, Funfair just came off as a bit nicer. And, and I'm not an antagonistic gamer. I'm not a player who does a lot of take that games. But Funfair was just too, too nice, I think, for the genre that it's trying to represent. Uh, and it has its place. It's a great game. It's really well made and it's really well balanced. It just didn't quite fulfill the need that I was personally looking for. So Funfair ended up at number nine. Yeah, for me, Funfair, I really dig. I really liked it. I, I think it is a fantastic introduction to that system of games, which uh, you can probably guess we're going to talk about the other game later. <laughs> um, I think it's great for that. It's a great gateway game. It's a great family game. If you want a, a light, fun game about building a theme park for your family get-together or to play with kids, I think it's a great recommendation. Absolutely. Number eight. This actually comes from the same company, so this was unplanned. I have another game from Good Games Publishing, and that is Land vs. Sea. Land vs. Sea is an abstract tile laying game where you are trying to build either land features or sea features and close them off to score points. At least that's the basic game. And to be honest, the basic game's good. The basic game's solid. It is a great gateway game. It is a great tile laying game, and I think families will love it. Where the game shines, though, is with optional scoring systems, and surprisingly, playing at three and four players. While the game seems to be built as a two-player game, don't believe that it is. Uh, This game, in my opinion, plays better with three and four with some variant rules. Now, I have a lot more to say about Land vs. Sea, and if you stay tuned to the whole episode, you'll get to hear our featured review later, where I will highlight Land vs. Sea, my number eight game of 2021, and actually released in 2021. Well, for me, it's... Codenames Duet. Now, this is not a new game at all, but it's new to me, and I finally got to experience that world that is Codenames Duet, the non-two-player game that yeah. sounds like it should just be a two-player game. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even think about the fact these two are together. That's funny. And uh, we have played this I, any number of times, especially in the digital version, uh, with our fantastic fans that joined us during our uh extra life streams this summer and played uh, with us digitally and got to experience the group play that is Codenames Duet. I still stand by the fact that Codenames Duet is the best version of Codenames. I have multiple versions of Codenames that are all mixed together in my Codenames Duet box because that's how I use it all. Codenames Duet, the team-based Codenames to me is a superior to the original competitive which is also still team-based, but compared to the cooperative version versus competitive. And I'm not even a huge co-op fan, so that's that's another one. Deanna also prefers it. Anytime you get Deanna loving a co-op game, it's got to be good. Absolutely. Moving on. <clears throat> Number seven, I have Riff Raff, the most precarious stacking dexterity game I have ever played in my entire life that takes some real skill and planning and strategy to be able to play at all properly. The key to Riff Rap is realizing that getting everything on the ship is not how you win the game, but rather catching the stuff that falls is a bigger part of the game than making sure you stack things correctly. This is a wooden ship on a gimbal with masts, masts 
that wobble. I, I, there is something fantastic about that game. One of the benefits of using this gimbal that I love, though, is it doesn't require a flat table. If your table's off center, the ships will still stay straight upright. A big bonus when playing at some, at least of our local game stores, whose tables have seen better days. I am so glad I bought this one off Jamie. So thank you, Jamie, uh, Will Chamberlain, local gamer, for selling me your copy of Riftcraft. Even though way back when we played it, I don't know how many years ago for the first time, I tried your copy. We got so frustrated just trying to assemble the thing we had given up. Yeah, Riffraff's an interesting one. Uh, you aren't going to find it. You aren't going to get it. This is not the new hotness, even yeah. slightly. But if you ever do get a chance to play a copy, it's definitely worth a play. Yeah, this is the one that might be older than Yardmaster. I'm not <laughs> positive. Uh, for me, the next up was Letter Jam. Uh, this one, uh, newer, it's not new, we, but it wasn't, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play that when we first reviewed it. So we decided to, you know, get it to the table when I was down at one point early in the year. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a fun. The scoring is a little weird, but the actual game itself is just such in, so, so enjoyable. Uh, it's a really great game. And again, just with most of these letter games, this, this style, the scoring is is always a little on the questionable side i honestly don't know how uh, party game scoring like, like, like I'd, I'd have to talk to like bruce vogue or some of the from the party game cast which is a now pod faded but an excellent old podcast about party games and people who play them um what what is up with party games with terrible scoring the letter jam scoring makes less sense than most i will say overly complicated and makes very little sense um that was a surprise hit for me it didn't make my top 10 um probably need to play it a few more times but what i did like about it is i can't think of another cooperative word building game and maybe they're out there but i can't think of any off the top of my head so i liked that because your personal vocabulary didn't matter right it was your group team's vocabulary and honestly words that you think the other people at the table will know are more important than spelling the longest thing. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect. Of the yep, no, absolutely. Number six, Roll Camera. Uh, we did a review of this one in this last year. This is another big hit that came out in 2021. So we do have some of those on our list. This is a worker placement game using dice that's different than Shadow Kingdoms because you are actually placing the dice. You are trying to make the best or worst film that's ever been made. Um, you're putting building sets, you're putting actors on the set, you're putting cameras on the set, you're holding meetings, you're trying to plan your budget, you're changing the script halfway through. It's all the chaos of making a movie in board game format. Uh, this one is a was published by Team Bean Publishing, but is being distributed by Grand Gamers Guild. And I think it's awesome that Mark reached out and got us a copy because this I probably would have just skipped right over. And it is a fantastic game. Like this may be a big hidden gem because I don't see anyone else talking about this game and it is really good. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do wish that we had managed to find the physical time for this one. That, that's one I missed out yeah, on. Yeah, you only got to play. That's right. You only physical. played on Tabletop Simulator. So uh, my number six is Aventuria. Uh, I know we have all talked about this game ad nauseum, I think. I don't know if people are sick of hearing it, but uh, I hope <laughs> not because we've still got a lot of content. Yes. Um, the problem, unfortunately, is only so much of that content is available online for us. So while I have taken part both digitally and physically, uh, we, we've, we've well exceeded the, uh, the digital components available to us. So without rehashing old missions and things and redoing things, uh, there's only so much I can do until, we can get, until I can get back down and uh, get to experience some of the content in a physical form. But that being said, all the times physical and digital I have played Aventuria have really been an enjoyable time. The biggest problem we are having with Aventuria is getting copies. So that is where this game is falling down. I feel guilty with how much we push this game and how awesome it is. And I want to share the love because it's that good. But you can't get it. No one else is getting to experience this like us. I, I would love to be having that shared experience of we've all played this together. Let's sit down and talk about what happened to you during Forest of Nova Turn. I can't do that with our fans. That is, that is my biggest disappointment with Aventuria. 
And I get it, global pandemic, uh, global shipping issues, container shortages, all the things going on in the world right now. I get it. It is coming. Adventuria is coming to North America. There, uh, there's a Kickstarter to be fulfilled, which includes a new printing of the game. It just, it's not here yet. So that is my only complaint about Adventuria at this point, is the fact that we can't share the love of this game with others. Absolutely. Number five. I have Unfair. Earlier, Sean was talking about Funfair. Unfair is the unfair version of Funfair, about building theme parks. Sounds strange to talk about it this way because technically Unfair came out way before Funfair. And the only reason I even tried out Unfair was because I got to review Funfair. And Funfair was so good that I want to try the whole game. I still think for anyone new to the game, you're better off trying Funfair. And if you like it, pick up Unfair. Uh, this is a theme park building game with all the nastiness Sean missed in the original. Uh, definitely more cutthroat. It's more of a gamer's game. There's extra phases to the game. There's more cards to manage. A fantastic theme park building game. Well, I do have to warn anyone playing, the biggest thing that's important when playing Unfair is knowing the cards. And I strongly recommend, again, start with Funfair just to get the mechanics down. Once you know the mechanics, make sure everyone has a list of all the cards that are in play and has looked through the decks before playing. Because it can be really nasty if you're surprised by things. And the key is to know what can be coming to prepare for it, just in case. I will admit, my first two plays of Unfair, I did not enjoy it at all, but I didn't know the cards. And I wanted to discover it. I just wanted to play. So we just mashed everything together and started playing. And having my park destroyed in the last two turns of the game, which completely made it unwinnable, really stank. Now that I know how the game plays, I know to keep defensive cards, or I know not to stack all my features on one ride. And so on. There's lots of ways to mitigate that nastiness. Just make sure everyone at the table is aware of how to play it properly. But yeah, the best, in my opinion, the best um, theme park building game out there. And there are a few. Like This includes the Dinosaur Park games as well, without mentioning them by name. Yeah, it's interesting. It's uh, There's definitely a difference in, in most deck building games. Uh, and this isn't technically a deck building game, but it, it you know, it's, it shares some, some, com but it, again, games like this, you want to just sort of throw the new stuff in and play and discover as you go. Uh, it's a very common way to do things. And mm -hmm. that just fails miserably in this game. You really do need uh, as much knowledge as you can get, especially as you start moving into the expansions where yes. things really come out of left. Uh, you've 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 moved beyond the basic uh, concepts of the game into the extra extra stuff, and that's where it can really come out of left field and shock you. Yeah, totally. Um, the other thing too you want to look at is not just like the type of things that can happen, the card distribution, especially when looking at the blueprints, knowing that there's only one or two copies of a card and save you from spending an entire game fishing for something that's not there, which can be nice. Yep, no, absolutely. All right, and uh, now next up we have another one. I'm actually sticking to almost newer stuff here. This is my second yeah. 2019 game, uh, is Tapestry from our friends at Stonemeyer Games. Uh, this one, I, I first I got to play digitally. Have I, have I played it physically yet? I don't think I have played it physically yet. Yeah, we played five players. Yes, we did. We yeah. played the five player physical. That's right. We're, we're told Cat managed to like fill her entire sideboard somehow. Uh, that's right. Yes. Um, I, I have played it a lot more digitally, especially now that BGA has a digital version of it. And let me tell you folks, it's fantastic on BGA, but don't try and learn it on BGA <laughs> as with most games. Uh, uh, we actually tried learn. We actually learned it on Tabletopia, which was a horrible, dis, painful experience. I'm surprised I learned the game. Surprised I like the game after that experience, but I do. Uh, not only is it a fun game with a whole huge level of variety, but the number, the the replayability, and just the quality of the pieces make it a fantastic physical in person game and that is tapestry from stonemeyer games the only thing i have to say about that right now is yes it is a civ game there we go number four the quacks of quedlinburg this was a big surprise hit for me i was not expecting this is i don't own a lot like i like heavier strategy games i like i like medium weight euros up to heavy games and i like having my brain engaged i like multiple decision points and solving puzzles right like that's generally what brings me to board gaming it's not often i find a game that's just fun 
Like it's just, it's engaging, it's fun. I'm laughing out loud. I'm cursing when I draw things wrong. There is not a lot of long-term strategy. You can kind of plan ahead and it, it, it's, it's so not my kind of game, but Quacks had me sold after the first play. It is a push your luck, draw things out of a bag game, try to mix your potions and get as thick a potion you can before it explodes. Um, then buy new regions to put in your later potions. There's a great catch-up mechanic with rat tails. This game is it's just way more fun and engaging than I expected it to be. It, it is not a light party game. It's got those Euro elements and that depth and complexity somehow all mixed in the pot so that it just works in this way that is so much fun. Yeah, no, I, my thing about Quacks is it is a friendly game yes it is almost the opposite of a take that for somehow despite the fact that randomness can mess you up and and, there's all these things and a lot of people have complaints about it for various reasons but at the end of the day it is just a friendly fun game to sit down and play with people and it's one of those games that reminds me of galaxy trucker right you're the fun is the journey who cares who wins Right, watching your ship blow up is just as much fun as pushing it and quacks and drawing that stupid three. What are we calling them now? I I, I can't even <laughs> snap bombs is the white bird cherry sure, bombs. Yeah. Whatever we're gonna call the white bad resource, drawing that three on your last turn and your pot blows up and you throw your bag down is just like sitting there getting hit by a big asteroid down the seven that splits your half and your ship in half. I, I I think there's a similar feel that some people are gonna hate, but you know what? I love both of those. The only problem with quacks is the bags and the tokens don't. Yeah, there mix are there well. are. It's not a perfect game. Check out our review for full details. But it's still my number four of twenty twenty one. And my number four is Space Base, just a fantastic game that we've gotten so much play out of, mm-hmm. uh, both physical and digital. Uh, the tabletop simulator is a fantastic. If you get the right one, it is the a right, fantastic yes. implementation of it. Uh, that really sort of helps players along and helps smooth things out and allows you to enjoy the game during this uh, tumultuous time. Um, I haven't gotten into all the expansion, into the expansion yet, but uh, as the base game is, I have really just thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, with Space Base, what we need to do, I, I haven't been feeling very well, obviously, is we still need to go through Shy Pluto on that app. Is it there, right? It's, it's so see if we can play through that so you get to experience it. Uh, Space Base, like I said it's in my top five played games this year. Like, it's, it's a great discovery. You know, like, why did it take us so long? <laughs> it's one of those games, like, it is not new at all. And I'm like, wow, it took us too long to get to that one. Number three for me is earlier on Sean's list, and that is Tapestry from Stonemeyer Games. Amazing production, really. Honestly, simple rules. Tapestry's rule book is four pages and it works. Literally, all you do every turn is I take income and I get a bunch of points and resources, or I advance on one of four tracks. Theme comes in when you read what you're doing on those tracks. I realize it's kind of pasted on, but if you actually look, you're developing agriculture and all that, you're getting technologies, you're upgrading technologies, you're building your capital with actual physical buildings. They come pre I should pre-painted is not really the right word because they're the pre-molded plastic that was already colored, but by like pre-painted miniatures, I have not had a bad game of tapestry yet. I have never cared if I like I care if I win or lose, but like I've never been like, oh, I got last in tapestry, or oh, I'm terrible at tapestry. It's never happened. I'm like, damn, I did last. I, either the sieve sucks or I don't know how to play this sieve, or like that's the one thing I haven't done that I often want to do is we finish a game and I'm like, can we replay with the same sieves? So I can try a different strategy. The number of civilizations in that game make it infinite replayable. Um, I know a lot of people out there hate on it, but I am a Tapestry fanboy. That one has totally won me over. I, what I need to do next is there's now two expansions for that game, even though I feel like I haven't really discovered everything in the original. Absolutely. Now, next up for me, uh, since I already talked about Tapestry, I'm going into my favorite genre, which is or while staying there, I guess, because Space Base was last, but staying in there is Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Again, this is almost newness. This is 2020 uh, publish. 
uh, even though the original game is yeah, a 2009 um, game. And this one technically didn't hit retail stores till this year. So it may count. It, it might <laughs> count as a 2021. The only people who were playing in 2020 kickstarted it. There you go. So this, and, and I mean, I, I have I have spoken at length about my love for these, these sci-fi games and the big sci-fi games like this one really hit the spot for me. And the the Eclipse Seth and Dawn Kickstarter, just the components and the, the way of storing things has just gone to the next level to make this game so much easier to play because of the setup and play components that it really is just not only a good game, but it's a good game that's easier to get to the table now. And that is always a win. So two reasons this isn't on my list. One, I got my copy in 2020. 2020. Um, but second is I've only played twice. And I've only played with three players. And I really feel before I can give this a final verdict, I need to get a big six-player game. Or at least a four-player. But I'm thinking a six-player game of Second Dawn. I love the original. Everything they have done to streamline the game is better. Uh, the new features are better. Like it, it, it's Eclipse Plus. And that's like, even if you threw out all the components and gave me the original components of the game, I would be happy. My only complaint about it is I actually don't like the new dice with the blips on them because the hits are only on the six, which is kind of weird. But other than that, I, Eclipse Second Dawn is the, the go to version of Eclipse and one of the best 4X games out there. I have been and always, I think, will be more of a fan of Eclipse than Twilight Imperium. There we go. Big number words. two number two is where i put space base because i it's my second most played game this year like that's ridiculous i have played so much space base and introducing it to new people i love the fact that something happens on everyone's turn like the it it's it's the machi coro the valeria the all of those except i really care what happens on other players turns i love the combos when you get one of those combos where if i roll five to eat i get these seven things it's so rewarding um the the various strategies we've seen people go for colonies we've seen people go for sevens we've seen people try to get the stupid card where you win the game if you get enough hangs on it the only complaint i have about space base is one card and yes i finally got there all you people who mocked me earlier who said this was the case there is one card that hurts other players that removes points from players that just makes the game longer and no one who has gotten this card has ever won with it. It just makes the game longer than it needs to be. And that is the, I, I forget the name of it, but it's the card that strips points from other players. Toss that out. Don't play with that. Other than that, Space Base, fantastic. Uh, got a full review on the blog. Also, Shy Pluto, we really enjoyed. So Shy Pluto, I do have a caveat on. You'll have to read the review to find out what I have a problem with on that one. Absolutely. And I've already said my love for Space Base. So uh, moving on, I'm going to now share my love or unfair, which was, again, we've already talked about earlier on the list. Uh, it just hit a little higher for me. Uh, now, part of that could be I haven't played all the expansions as fully as you have. And I know some of your problems came from certain of the newest expansion pack, uh, which I haven't gotten to the table yet. So, But barring that, what I have played so far and the, the three-player and two-player games I've played have been fantastic. And again, this is a rare take that game that I really like. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's what helped push this up on my uh, list higher because, again, it's it's not a style or theme of game that I go for. But it was hitting a lot of those Roller Coaster Tycoon type vibes for me. And, and just, it felt right. Uh, and that is unfair. So it was funny. One of the comments I almost put in the notes earlier today, but I didn't. And I, I don't know if I should have, but I can save it for now. Is we got a comment on the one YouTube video, and it's our review of Unfair, and it's Tron plays Unfair, eats Funfair. <laughs> and I was I was amused by that. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, pretty much. More like Tron <laughs> really liked Funfair. I like, did. He, he's it like, yeah, good. Funfair is this, but like when he played it before playing Unfair, he was like, this is one of the best games you own. This is a fantastic game. I really dig this. Like he really liked Funfair, but then he played Unfair, and he's like. I never play, play fun fairies. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> throw that game out. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. It's very true. <laughs> so that was funny. So yeah, unfair on both our lists. That that's that's possibly between the two of us, one of our strongest recommendations. All right. My number one, this is where you insert the drum roll uh sound that I know you found. <laughs> uh for me, that's Adventuria. The Adventuria adventure card game from Ulysses Spiel, an adventure card, excuse me, an adventure card game 
set in the world of the Dark Eye, Das Blas Og, from Germany, the the most popular role playing game in 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 um, in Germany, converted to card game format, including all of the classic adventures that you can now play through in this card game. There are some things that are just unperfect in this game, in my opinion. Now, the game does include a dual mode where it's like playing magic. That wasn't for me. I'm sure there's people out there that like it, but the real highlight of that game is the cooperative adventure mode where you pick one of the adventures you own, you pick one of four difficulty levels, you pick a hero and you play through an adventure, which involves playing through a linear storyline where you're going to make a couple skill checks and then have some type of boss fight, we'll call it, because they're not always fights. And your skill checks are going to impact that boss fight, either giving you bonuses or penalties. What has really blown me away about this game is two things. One, the difficult decision of what of your cards to turn to endurance. So the mana system in an adventure is just fantastic. It, it adds this, this complexity to the game and this difficulty that I really enjoy of you have to toss cards out of your deck to be able to do anything with the rest of your cards. You are, every turn are going to pick up the two cards basically removed from the game to be able to use your rest of your stuff and man if you built your deck everything you put in there is for a reason right so it's i love that difficult decision and i am blown away by the variety in the quests especially those boss fights the the main part of the game where you're doing the big end of the adventure fight how different everyone has been from swinging from chandeliers to stabbing werewolves with silver cutlery to trying to escape a flooded room and it all uses the same mechanics and somehow works to tell different stories every time. Honestly, this is the game has blown me away. It is such a great game. Yeah, and I mean, the, again, I said before, the only reason this isn't higher on my list is because I have, because of pandemic reasons, haven't been able to experience all of the content we've gotten. I've seen it unboxed, but I haven't actually gotten to play with it. And that's been, that's what's kept it from being my absolute favorite is because it's just not, I haven't done it. Yeah, you haven't played it. <laughs> well, you've only ever played anything in the base box, right? You haven't even seen Forest. Well, you played... Yeah, no, we did play Forest. One of them. Yeah, yeah, we, we did played... part one of Forest. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but again, we haven't haven't done all that much of it. Yeah. Uh, and then, so for me, <laughs> is uh, my number one game, and this one is going to sound a little amusing to some people, but it's Draconis <laughs> Invasion. Now, for one thing, I love deck builders. Deck mm -hmm. builders are my thing. That's, you know, me and my family all love deck builders. But the thing about Draconis Invasion is it, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't by any means perfect, but it kept us wanting to play more. You know, we talked about how, yes, we played this because we needed to get the review done and we wanted to get through the whole campaign to make sure we reviewed it properly. But we played it more than we needed to. Like that, especially yeah. in the first box, before we got to the expansion, we kept playing this game more than we had to. We only needed mm -hmm. to play a few games and we kept going back to it and we kept wanting to try more and we were frustrated at some of the failures of the game and i think that's a fantastic sign if you're invested enough in a game to see a problem and get angry that they didn't do it better because you wanted the game to be better that's a good thing i, I did dig this one it, it was a surprise how good it is they did some things very right but the game does have some problems uh, that that sums it up well. Uh, there were definitely some things I would wished were fixed, but yeah, like Sean said, it was it was like, why do I keep wanting to play this? But I do. So they did something right. There was a there was secret ingredients. There was something you know stirred in the pot. Something done right. The the there was something added to it. Right. There, there's a reason I keep buying Tim Hortons coffees on my way to work, even though. I'm like, man, Tim Hortons is not the best coffee. Yep. The Draconis is the Tim Hortons of deck builders. It's like you, you just keep going back to it, even though it has some flaws and definitely isn't the best, best yep. deck builder. Absolutely. But I'll admit, I considered putting it on my list. I I, I considered it, but I didn't. It, it, the other games I thought were better. If I was doing a top 20, top 25, it'd probably be number. Yep. All right, so I do also have one honorable mention. So that is the fact that this year, for some reason, well, I kind of know the reason, but we rediscovered Castles of Burgundy. Uh, this is a classic Steffenfeld game. Many people claim it is the best Steffenfeld game. I'm still, uh, maybe. Um, I've owned this since the original Aaliyah printing. I don't know what year it came out, but I bought it the year it came out. Um, and we never played it. Like, I have had this forever. People say it's the best two-player game on the market. 
Deanna and I have date nights and we never play it. And that's because it's fiddly. It's all kinds of thin cardboard hexes that have to be sorted in by color. Some are all the same. All the greens are the same. All the browns are the same or whatever. But then other ones have to be randomized. And then you got to go through and find the ones with black dots on them because they go in a different place on the board. And then every round you lay out, and it's like 25 of them or something like that. Well, it's more because of the middle. You got six different spots with fours. I don't know, like 30 tiles you got to go lay out. All randomized. And at the end of the round, you got to clear them out. It's just so fiddly. Like setting up the tiles for each round of this game takes longer than it does to play the game. What changed all this? Board Game Arena launched a fantastic adaptation of the game. And if it wasn't for that, I'd probably still have it downstairs and people say, what do you think of Castles of Burgundy? I'm like, oh, it's great, but it's fiddly. Being able to play it without all that setup and fiddliness and sorting. And the worst part is like I baggied everything, so it's easier. But then people put it away wrong because they see a farm and it's got they missed that it's got a black dot. So it ends up in the bag. I I this honestly has bumped it up. That it, it Amerigo, I always say is my favorite feld. Trajan's up there. This may actually be the best feld once you strip out all that fiddliness. Right especially when playing with experienced players. Now that we, we currently have a four player game going and everyone now understands all the scoring opportunities, <laughs> I think it's how I'll word it. It has become really tight. Like our scores are neck and neck and it's like, Oh, you got that stupid thing just before I did and hate drafting. And Oh, it, it, it has gotten to almost like, it feels like a chess like at this point where you're like, Oh, I think you're going to do this then this. So I'm going to do this to disrupt that. Meanwhile, there's two other players I'm not worrying about who are probably kicking my ass because I'm so focused on this one thing. I, I am really enjoying, like, that, that. that is, in a way, one of the biggest hits of the year is a game I've owned for years. Yeah, and indeed, while my first couple of games were rough because I decided to go in raw and not do any rule watching or anything, <laughs> I'd never been taught the game. I just sat down and started playing. Uh, and Dee's pointing out in the chat room that the tool tips in that game are yes. really a huge benefit of the implementation because a lot of the graphics are a little on the similar side. So the fact that you can mouse over and see what it is you're mm -hmm. getting, that's a huge benefit. Uh, even but, without that, even if the buildings look distinct, remembering what each building yeah. does was terrible in that game. And so that what, was a game I had to have the reference sheet up and passing it around con constantly. So now we've always said that learning games on BGA is a problem. And yeah. it, I, I proved that <laughs> it definitely, it definitely took me a couple of times, but uh, some offline chatter with Mo and things mm -hmm. and, and realizing what things people were, other people were doing finally got it into me and I've hit my stride where I'm, I'm keeping pace in the group games. I even got a real time game in with one of our Patreon patrons and their partner nice. one night. Uh, they, they saw me online and, and hit me up and we jumped in and, and played through a game uh, and I was right there with them. So that was uh, that was fun to know and fun to do. Yeah, this is one where I actually did break out my physical copy and played with Deanna because Deanna was having a real hard time. Like she's reading the rules online and playing on Board Game Arena. And she's like, I just don't get it. Like it's just not clicking. So we, yeah. we have brought out our physical copy, brought it over to the in-laws. Like, like I, my physical copy got played because Board Game Arena exists. I got to thank Board Game Arena, and even for that, for getting an old game on my shelf played again. That's what I and need. Honestly, to do. I want to bring it out to public play. Like I want, I want to go to the CG realm and play Battles of Battles. Saying the wrong name, uh, the Castles of Burgundy, with four players, like in person, right there. I think that's what I need with Zolkin because I am clearly not getting it <laughs> in Zolkin. <laughs> I haven't been watching. I just, I, I know I lost by two points because I missed that it was last. I round lost by twenty five. So. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> So I realize, I, I don't know if you're still around, if you care about this, but a lot of people, when they hear best of 2021, want to hear about games that were released in 2021, right? Most people want to hear about the hotness. What was the best games that came out this year? Games released 2021. So looking at both our lists, there really aren't a lot of these, obviously, and we kind of explained why already. So I did have Shadow Kings of Valeria, Roll Camera, and Land vs. Sea on my list. But that's lit between the both of us for 2021 games. So... As usual, we're not about the new hotness here, but I do want to give a short list of other great games that I played this year that were published this year. These are our, our endorsements. These are recommendations. These are games that I thought were really solid, but not good enough to make my top 10 when compared to older games that I tried for the first time this year. When you're mashing all the games together, you can't fit them all. 
So number one is the Red Bernus Algeria 1857. So I am not sure if this belongs on this list or if it belongs in next year's list because it's not actually being published till 2022. Uh, I played a prototype of this game. This is a great combo of deck building and cubes on a map wargaming that I think both deck builders and wargamers are going to dig. It's a historically accurate game that addresses a very interesting period of time that I think is worth checking out. Next, I've got the new editions of Galaxy Trucker and World's Fair 1893. So these are reprintings of old games that have been tweaked. I don't think these are the best choices for games that already own the originals. There is not enough difference from the original printings to the new, I think, to justify purchasing the new versions. But if you don't already own Galaxy Trucker or already own World's Fair, now is the time to get them. Not only have they improved the game slightly and done a few tweaks, they're also cheaper than they used to be which is not something you can say often about games. So those two releases I do strongly recommend. Next is a little wordy, which was a surprise hit for me because it's from Exploding Kittens, which is usually silly push your luck party games. This is a very solid two-player word-based game. And finally, I have Gorinto. This would have been on my list, but again, I played the prototype back in 2020, so I wasn't sure if I should put it on, which is the same reason I probably shouldn't have put on Shadow Kingdoms. So since I put Shadow Kingdoms, I probably should have put Garento on. But Garento is now getting out to backers in 2021. This is an amazing abstract strategy game that I like to joke is the Azul Killer. Because I really do think if enough people play this game, it could be as busy, as popular as Azul. You are drafting tiles to put them onto your own personal player board. The more of each tile you have, the more tiles you can draft. And you're doing variable end game scoring. So what you're looking for one game changes the other like each time and what i really recommend is i think the base gameplay should be the one where you put out four different cards and they cycle every round so you can plan ahead that adds a level of strategy that i think was missing in the base game. fair enough i think you know world camera was one of those uh tabletop simulator plays which was fun but just never quite as much fun i think if i had gotten to physically play it when i was down yeah. it probably would have hit my top 10 totally fair so the last thing I want to talk about today is what our biggest board game surprise was. So what was the game that surprised you in 2021? You know, I would have to say it's a toss up between Aventuria and Draconis, but I think I'm going to give it to Draconis uh, because we knew from the sheer volume of Aventuria, <laughs> you're going to be getting a bang for your buck, even if it's not the most fantastic game, which it turns out it probably is uh, a, a fantastic game uh, with so much content there's a whole lot to work with whereas mm -hmm. draconis we had no idea what no. to expect we knew we were getting a deck builder that's kind of it uh yep. it could have been completely forgettable and yet while again while it had its problems it shocked us as it kept us wanting to play more and you know yep. as d was d was blown away that this was my number one <laughs> and uh and again it shocked me too yeah oh fair I think I already talked about it enough. Um, if I if I planned this better, maybe I would have picked another game. But it's just how much we love Adventuria, how much we have been enjoying that, and how much other people have enjoyed it. How much like Tori now? Every time I'm like, oh, we're getting together Friday. He's like, yeah, can we play Adventuria? So so he is totally smitten with the game. I know Kat's been enjoying it. It has been a great date night game for Deanna and I to play, and it works as a co-op because some cooperative games are not good date night games because you end up frustrated with the other player playing incorrectly or whatever. Aventurius like eliminates all that um, quarterbacking because they got a deck of 30 cards. I don't know what's in their hand. I can't tell them how to play their cards. Maybe I can make some suggestions like attack with this weapon first, but it has been a great cooperative experience. The stories are engaging. And as I mentioned, the, what they have done to keep the game fresh with the same base of core mechanics. It's not like every boss fight has a new set of rules. Like, oh, in this, we're going to break the rules and do this. Like, no, it's just the, the, the combination of henchmen and story cards. And yes, some of the expansions added new things like environments. But the way that game has been kept fresh from the expansions is blowing me away. And the fights are engaging enough that I want to play them again. I do want to go back and try a game on higher difficulties to see if we would have succeeded. I, I want to see how things could play out different. What if the different henchmen come up? Like, and the fact that every time I add an expansion to the game, it adds content to the entire game. So when I pick up Forest of Lost Souls, not only do I get to play Forest of Lost Souls, I get a bunch of henchmen that go into my deck and a new hero to play. So now I could go back and play through Master Taylor's Poltergeist, say, with 
a totally different henchman deck, or well, Master of Poker is a bad example. You have the set deck of eight cards, but I could go back to I'm oh, I'm totally forgetting the name of all the adventures in the base book, the one where you're trying to guess the goblin's name, and I could play through that with a new hero, which would make it feel unique. Uh, that game really has blown me away, and I am so sorry I can't give you a link to go purchase it anywhere in North America right now. Uh, the last place we saw that had copies was in uh, Noble Knight Games. Was the last place I've been able to play. Now we are here to answer your gaming and game night question. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 